Well, let's look at fisheries then. Ocean fisheries uh, are a major source of food, as I said, a growing source of food in an efficient industry. Interesting thing about ocean fisheries, perhaps, uh, the most interesting thing is that of all the things that human beings eat on this planet and commercially expend energy to, uh, to, to, to produce and sell as food, it's the only significant source of wild captured animal food. Most of the fish that come from the ocean are still wild fish. It's as if we were rounding up buffalo and selling them in the supermarket uh, from, from the open plains in very large numbers today. Now, um, something like 79% of all fish from the ocean is wild capture. So that's most of them. But 21% of the fish from the open ocean, or from the ocean, that is seafood, is mariculture, that is fish farming of the ocean. And so much of this is actually in pens, but held in the sea. Some of it, as we'll see, is, is even done in different ways. It's a growing proportion, but uh, it's not the majority by far of the, of the saltwater fishery or saltwater fishing industry. By contrast, the land-based freshwater aquaculture, so the growing of fish for food, but in fresh water and using freshwater species is a rapidly rising, rapidly growing industry, something like 46% of the total supply um, of all those fish and, uh, and, and, and quickly changing and quickly changing in different parts of the world where the protein from fish is in high demand and so is continuing to grow. Well, what's happening globally to catches of fish though is that through all this pressure and the efficiency of the industry, Fish are being caught, of course, at phenomenal rates, and they are largely not reproducing fast enough for the wild fisheries to keep up. There are some exceptions, but most of the wild fisheries are being fished to a point where no more can, in fact, be found and caught, and their numbers are at very small proportions of their apparent sort of pre-industrial or historical levels. If we look at data from uh, around 1992, so a couple of decades ago, we see that the commodity fish, the white fish like cod, hake, and haddock, uh, represented a, a pretty big proportion, something greater than 10, 10 or 15 percent of the total catch of wild fish. Uh, tunas and things like that were only about 4 percent, the tunas and bonitos. All the various fish represented about 87 million metric tons of weight in that particular year. If we look to the present day, we see that the total wild capture fisheries have largely kind of plateaued and not grown in size much since that time. So there was increasing catch, increasing catch up until the late 1980s or early 1990s. And then with fluctuations, it's largely flattened out. Now, actually, most of the world has somewhat decreased its catch of open ocean capture fisheries. But China has become a major player over that time, going from very little, almost insignificant proportion of the world's total capture to the largest single uh, catcher of fish um, of, of all wild captured fish of the entire planet. But that's only maintained that sort of very, fairly steady level. The interesting thing about this steady, apparent, you know, sort of continuous um, uh, a number or, or fraction of total fish that are captured, which still remains around 90 million or so metric tons per year, is that uh, it's not the same species over time. One will come in to replace another whose population is declining. Then as that formerly less desirable fish species also starts to decline, a new one will start to be caught. And so we've seen over the last few decades different fish come and go, literally on restaurant menus and in supermarkets, as they become more available and then less available as they were overfished to the point where their populations were not sustaining themselves. So if we look at the catch trends by individual groups, we can see that those ones I referred to as the, the commodity fish, um, the biggest grouping in the early 1990s, have been in a sort of inexorable decline since the 90s. And now only about something less than 8 million metric tons, a much smaller quantity of the cod, hake, and haddock, and all of those fish uh, are being caught today. Um, and it, un unless the amount of fish that are being caught declines, that decline will just simply continue to go down because they're not reproducing at the rate. They're not being caught less because people don't want to catch them. They're being caught less because the fishing industry, the fishing fleets are working harder to catch as many as they can and still finding declining productivity of those fish or declining catches. By contrast, uh, the catch rate of things like tuna, 
um, bonito and the other tuna-like fish are going up rapidly, as are the invertebrates like squids and cuttlefish and octopus. These are growing in popularity and they're replacing the big, uh, the, the, the big fleshy fish, uh, fin fish, uh, because those fin fish are getting harder to catch. And so the, the squids and things like that are becoming more popular fish to, to obtain. The tuna story in particular is largely one of changes in taste, uh, uh, taste meaning fashion, that is, and popularity of those fish over time. Scarcity, you know, uh, shapes these trends in the sense that the white fish are going down, the pollock, the cod, and haddock uh, are just simply not available in the same kinds of numbers. The fashion, though, of basically um, the world discovering Japanese sushi and starting to eat it all over the planet and the popularity of sushi in America and in Europe and South America and everywhere else has led to an incredible increase in the rate of fishing for bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna, bonito, and all those tunas. Um, and one that has been growing through the, through the early part of the 21st century, but appears to be on an absolute collision course with a rapid decline as, this, as these populations are, are overfished as well. Well, aquaculture, and especially the inland or freshwater fish aquaculture, has taken up the slack between the growth of, of ocean fish, worldwide uh, capture fish, and the increasing need for fish food as the world population grows. And so um, we see a, a sort of diverging trend of flat ocean capture fish, but a growing trend of generation of aquaculture. And inland aquaculture is the most, um, uh, the, the, the most growing part of the fishing industry overall. We could ask the question, what's driving all of this growth in the fishing industry? What is driving the, the pressure on the open ocean capture fisheries? And the answer is fairly simple. It's one that was talked about a lot a few decades ago, but really isn't being talked about quite so much anymore, but hasn't gone away. And that's human population growth. The number of people on the planet is continuing to increase at an exponential rate. There are twice as many people on Earth today as in 1965. And the rate of doubling for the next doubling on the planet is going even faster. Now, the population may level off at 9 billion or 10 billion or some number like that. But in the meantime, there are many, many more people on Earth and they need food. Fish is relatively, um, uh, obviously, high quality food and relatively inexpensive to produce in agriculture. So it's taking up the slack. If we look at an even longer trend in world population, we see that, you know, we live again in some sort of singularity and change uh, uh, of the way the planet works because there were very, very few people, much less than a billion, for tens of thousands of years. We look at 10,000 BC to the present, we see the rise in population with the agricultural revolution, and then ultimately with the industrial revolution, we see the sudden rise to the six and a half billion and counting that are on the planet today. Well, we can ask the question, where are the fish? Where are all the big fisheries in the world? And for a long time, it was the North Atlantic was the biggest fishery, with the Pacific second to that. But decades ago, that transition to the point where the Pacific Ocean as an aggregate is the vast majority of fishing on the planet. The Northwest Pacific itself, the region of high productivity and the high latitudes in the Northwest, represents something like 25% of the total uh, global fishery, uh, global capture fishery, global wild fishing, and other parts of the Pacific Ocean added together come up to something close to or, or well over uh, half of all the ocean fishing. And of course, this is partly the historical trend of just fishing having been developed in different parts of the world earlier and then later, and then the great growth of the Chinese fishing industry, uh, as well as other countries, including the United States, um, intensively fishing the Northwest Pacific and Bering Sea. So what are the trends in global fisheries? Well, the Atlantic catch is declining rapidly at this point. Many of the different fisheries uh, peaked in the early 2000s, if not much earlier than that for certain fish like cod, um, but now they're declining rapidly in recent years. And uh, most recent assessment in 2010 by the UN FAO says that uh, 13 to 30 percent declines in the catches of important um, Atlantic fin fish, the large fish that we think of as the major, the major players in, um, in what we buy in the supermarket or, or at the restaurant. The Pacific trends have been growing rapidly over all those years but are now leveling off and catches are not increasing despite increasing effort. 
um, by increasingly technological fishing fleets. The Indian Ocean catch is sustaining, but patterns are changing, especially with that declining tuna catch, or with a declining tuna catch. So let's look at how open ocean capture fishing is actually done for a few minutes. Well, by far the largest tonnage is trawling for fish. Trawling with big uh, nets, with nets that are, their mouths are held open. The net mesh and size is, is, uh, is configured to, to catch particular species or particular groups that, that one wants to catch. There are fundamentally two types of trawling that we can look at. The midwater trawling, which is simply dragging a trawl net through the middle of the ocean, as you might, you might imagine. And then bottom trawling, which involves a trawler with heavy weighted wheels, literally to roll across the bottom of the ocean and uh, scoop up everything in its path um, with the mouth of the net hugging the bottom very closely so that it catches bottom dwellers, but also water dwellers for some distance up above the actual benthic environment. So we have sort of pelagic fishing and benthic fishing, as it were. So this stern trawler netting is the majority of commercial catching, and uh, it involves nets that are very large open nets that can stand hundreds of feet in height. They catch a great number of fish, but they also catch a great number of fish that were not the fish they were intending to catch. This is called bycatch, and it's a very large problem in the fishing industry because up to 25% of all the fish that are caught are non-targeted species. They're caught, they're even edible perhaps, um, but when they're brought on deck of the ship, if the ship is set up for processing of a certain type of fish, um, then those are the ones that are kept and everything else is literally just swept over the side, unfortunately dead by the time it gets there um, because they've been caught in this net and brought to the surface. So it's a fish kill that's, uh, that's unfortunate because it's a completely a byproduct of the actual food industry that's involved. Now, a second major type of fishing that's used to target the large open ocean fish like tuna and swordfish is what's called pelagic longline fishing. Long, up to 10 kilometer or more long uh, filament lines are stretched out from ships or are deployed from ships with floats along them to keep them in the near surface and then just simply individual baited hook lines hanging down off of them to catch uh, those, those predator fish that, that like to go after that bait. Um, they have relatively small amounts of bycatch, but unfortunately the bycatch that they do uh, come up with tend to be sea turtles and marine mammals. And so organisms that we, have, we place a high value on and that often are, are endangered. Um, so even catching a few of them is, is kind of bad news. Now one type of open ocean fishing for these same organisms that was essentially banned with the big move to come up with dolphin safe tuna was open ocean drift net fishing. Similar to the long lines by deploying very long nets that actually act more or less like fences in the sea. Uh, fish are caught by their gills as they try to swim through these nets. The nets also catch, of course, anything that run it, runs into them. And unfortunately, when a marine mammal runs into one of these open ocean drift nets, a dolphin or seal or sea lion, they'll drown before the net is reeled back into the ship to take the fish off because, of course, those are, those are mammals. They have to breathe. And so we see many, many examples of dolphins and seals caught in these open ocean drift nets. Drift, net, drift netting has been banned, but it doesn't mean the process, uh, the, the practice has completely stopped because it still is economically valuable, so, so fishing industries from some countries will still practice um, open ocean drift netting despite international treaties banning that practice. Well, when we look at fisheries management then, we can talk about something called the maximum sustainable yield, right? How much of any fish species can be harvested each year in a given fishery region without depleting stocks for future years? So there's a current estimate, you know, of all fish in the global ocean of something of between 100 and 135 million tons per year, but that includes all of the fish farming activities as well. The open ocean fishery appears to be right at the maximum sustainable yield or perhaps even on the high side for the wild capture fish that we're currently fishing economically in the ocean. And many of the specific species in the ocean are certainly overfished. An estimated something like 72% of all fisheries are being overfished today and many of the others are right at their maximum sustainable yields. Um, so they're what is called fully utilized or fully exploited fisheries and very few fisheries that are economically viable are underexploited. The industry is good at getting out there and finding the fish. 
And perhaps you've heard about you know, the, the scale at which the open ocean fishing industry operates. Out in deep water, especially away from the exclusive economic zones of different countries, then large fishing fleets operate with uh, individual trawlers fishing a given region, finding the fish using satellite imagery, using specialized sonar and all sorts of things, using spotter boats, trawling up large amounts of fish, and then actually bringing them to factory vessels that are big, uh, industrial, essentially fish canneries that operate at sea that are processing those fish right at sea, literally down to the point of putting them in, you know, tuna cans or anchovy cans and shipping those back off to, uh, to land with, um, with cargo vessels. The factory fishing ships sometimes don't leave the ocean literally for years at a time. They're resupplied uh, and, and, and restaffed uh, periodically, but they stay out at sea in the productive fisheries. Well, the fisheries that are overexploited, the numbers are starting to rapidly dwindle and the fisheries are in danger of collapsing. And this isn't a new story. This has already happened to a number of fisheries over the course of the 20th century. If we look at uh, a recent scientific estimate of the total biomass of what are called the high trophic level fish in the North Atlantic over the course of the 20th century, cod, perch, anchovies, and flatfish, the big fish that are the, were the familiar ones uh, that represented seafood for, for most of our lives. Um, estimates of the total biomass that existed in 1900 compared to 1999 show a really disturbing trend. And th these are where the big, you know, um, uh, Newfoundland banks uh, fisheries were, the New England fishers, uh, all up and down the Atlantic seaboard where cod was big and all of these other fish. There were, there were many tons of fish per square kilometer, many large areas with 10 tons or more of fish per square kilometer based on computer simulation, catch rates in those days, and all sorts of complicated analysis in 1900. And then if we look at how that evolved to 1950 and then ultimately to 1999, the shrinkage of those fisheries and the collapse of those ecosystems is remarkable. There are now virtually no areas with 10 tons of fish per square kilometer in the entire North Atlantic region. And even the few areas that are viable fishing grounds anymore are down to three to four or so. So it's been a collapse of a major chunk of the world's ocean fishery over the span of a century. And the same thing is now playing out with different organisms, but in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and other places around the world. The bluefin tuna is the, is the current example that's maybe the poster child, but the most frightening one. Bluefin tuna catch, as we saw, was rapidly increasing. It peaked in 2007, and just in the years since then, there have been rapidly declining stocks. It's not yet an endangered fish, but it's pretty clear it's on its way rapidly. And it's because, again, of all of that sushi, sushi and sashimi that are on the plates of diners all over the world with a taste for bluefin tuna. And it's not surprising that they're being fished to this level when an individual highly prized Atlantic bluefin can sell on the Tokyo fish market, as makes the news regularly, in excess of $200,000 if they're really high quality bluefin tuna. And so this really brings us to the problem of the question of why does the fishing industry overfish? Well, it's fundamentally something that's referred to often as the tragedy of the commons. The idea that if there's a resource, like a wild fishery, that's available to a large group of people in common, it benefits each individual member to maximize his or her use, even if it would be better for everyone to get together and agree to limit their own catch. The story comes from the commons, meaning the open uh, grazing areas in, in the British Isles uh, from the, 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 the medieval period where everybody had the rights to graze sheep on the common ground, so it was always to your benefit to graze more sheep than you used to or than your neighbor does because you get more of the benefit back from the resource that's held in common. The fisheries work this way too, and without government regulation, a few fishing industries, a few groups of associations of, 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 of fishing boat owners have been able to voluntarily limit their catch, but largely this has not been possible in the world. And again, it's not a surprise because the personal economics that each of those fishing boat owners face really forces them in the face of a declining fishery to redouble their efforts. If the catch is going down, they already have a large investment in fishing boats and nets 
and they have to support their crew, they have to support their families. And so they'll go out and of course, for each individual, they wanna get the most of whatever is out there for themselves relative to all of their competitors in the region. And so in the face of that declining catch, they try harder and harder. And when individual fish are worth a lot of money, there's a good chance literally down to the very last one, or at least the very last uh, viable breeding population will be caught one day of many of these fish unless real intervention happens. Well, so the replacement for most of this is aquaculture. And today, something like 37% of all fish for human consumption is represented by um, freshwater or what we call inland aquaculture. And a large amount of this is tilapia. Tilapia is an African freshwater fish that happens to be very well suited to, uh, to, to growing in fish farms and it's showing up on restaurant menus everywhere. It's a large part of the growth of that Chinese aquaculture industry. And maybe this will ultimately take some of the pressure off open ocean fish. The other form of fish farming that is uh, becoming more common but growing more slowly is mariculture. And that's the farming of marine seawater organisms. So shrimp are cultured, and Atlantic salmon are cultured in large numbers. Oysters are another example. But still only about 20% of saltwater fish, and most fish species are just not amenable to culturing in enclosed pens. With salmon, there's been some uh, success with actually what people have referred to as salmon ranching, like a ranch in the Wild West, um, uh, spawning the salmon in pens, but then sending them out to sea and uh, relying on their natural homing instinct to come back uh, when it's time, when they're fully grown so that they can be harvested once again. But all this mariculture is probably not going to replace the open ocean fishing industry in the way that inland aquaculture is going to. Well, in closing of this uh, uh, sort of um, overview of fishing, I want to say that maybe there's some things that we should all think about doing, and that in particular is make the environmentally responsible fish choices. The overfishing uh, is a stark reminder of the limited nature of resources in what used to seem like a limitless ocean. We can make choices of fish that are being sustainably harvested or being cultured in a sustainable way. Um, it's very confusing often. There's so many different kinds of fish that show up on the menu at the restaurants, but there are some resources. The Monterey Bay Aquarium in particular publishes an excellent pocket seafood selector. You can print out and actually take with you or look at uh, as an app on a on a you know, mobile device or something like that and see immediately which fish to avoid and which fish are sort of uh, um, a given the green light to enjoy as, as seafood from the ocean. Well, we've seen that the global wild fish populations are under this intense pressure driven by economics and demand for food. Inland and marine aquaculture will have to carry more of the burden if these wild stocks are to recover. So in the next lecture, we're going to follow those fish, perhaps inland in some sense, and head up to the shoreline and look at the processes that govern its development, ultimately to lead us back into the benthic realm and starting in shallow water and going deeper and deeper and looking at all the habitats at the bottom of the ocean.